Good evening. Welcome to this online event launching new poetry collections by David Constantine, Kerry Hardy and Bill Herbert. Kerry's new collection, Where Now Begins, was published last Thursday. David's collection, Belongings, and Bill's collection, The Wreck of the Fathership, both came out at the end of October. They're all available to buy from the Blood Axe website. I'm Neil Astley, the editor of Blood Axe Books, and I'm going to chair tonight's event. David, Kerry, and Bill are three very different poets, but they share many concerns in their work. And in these three collections in particular, mortality and mourning, family and individual responsibility, the private and the public, the communities we're all part of, and how that sense of belonging extends to our relationship with the natural world and the earth as a whole. David Constantine is going to read first, followed by Kerry Hardy and then Bill Herbert, and then we'll have the same again, David, Bill, uh, David Kerry and, and then Bill. So we're gonna start off with David, David's poetry is informed by a profoundly humane vision of the world. His book's title, Belongings, signals that these are poems concerned with our possessions and with what possesses us, with where we belong. Another kind of belonging is also challenged, our relationship with the planet to which we belong, but which does not belong to us. Since publishing his first collection, With Blood Axe, in 1980, and that was one of the very first books published by Blood Axe. David has published nine other books of poetry and five translations with Blood Axe, including his collected poems in 2004 and three later collections, Nine Fathom Deep, Elder, and now Belongings. For over 30 years, he was a university lecturer in German, firstly at Durham and then at Oxford. His translations have included editions of Friedrich Hörlin, Henri Michaud, Philippe Jacoté, and Hans Magnus Enzensberger from Blood Axe, winning the European Poetry Translation Prize and the Cornelio M. Popesco Prize for European Poetry Translation for two of those books. He is co-translator of the collected poems of Bertolt Brecht, published by Norton, and was co-editor of Modern Poetry and Translation from 2004 to 2013. He's also a prolific writer of fiction with one of his short stories, adapted into 45 years, a major film starring Tom Courtney and Charlotte Rampling. He lives in Oxford and on Briar, one of the Silly Isles. And tonight he's gonna to be reading and talking about his book with us from Oxford. So I'd like to welcome David. David, you are now on screen and you can start reading. Thank you very much for that generous introduction. And it's a great pleasure to be here, even in, in this uh, slightly odd sense. The other, probably by now archaic understanding of the word belonging is, is of kind of rightness. So we might say that things are or are not how they belong to be. And in the book, I've consider both those possibilities. I'll start with a poem called Eye Test, a visit to the optician, that is. In the third stanza, there's the Latin phrase arbor vitae, which means tree of life, and is actually used to describe that area at the back of the brain, just above the spinal column, when there's a kind of tree-like foliage branching of the possibilities within the brain. The ophthalmologist asked, what could I see? Dead stuff floating, I replied, the usual wispy debris. On some days, a black spot, a tiny black moon, sidles across the right eye on a trajectory of its own. I said I liked to lie on hills under big skies, viewing only the muted red inside my lids. I can show you better than that, she said, and did. She showed me the tracery of blood on the globes of the eyes, the paths and streams of it. Her science, her instruments, gave me a joyous peace of mind. I shall lie high in the heather 
under the sun in a still excitement and shut my eyes and watch the arbor vitae putting up, putting out through the rings of bone ever more finely on the vast and painless red, branching, leafing, flowering. Happy the dead who out of their life's deep humus show what they have seen. Neil uh, mentioned translating Hölderlin. Um, what I'd like to read now is a chorus from Sophocles' play Antigone, a chorus which uh, Hölderlin translated with the whole play and indeed with um, Oedipus Rex as, as well, in a, for its day, very, very radical uh, fashion. I've translated his translation two or three times and, and, and finally, I think, um, into something which is less a translation than a fetching of the concerns into our modernity. Sophocles himself was anxious about what man might do, his, his, in the sense of transgression, Hölderlin more so, and I think in our generation, perhaps as much as it's possible to be anxious about what we might do. Chorus from Sophocles, Antigone. Monstrous a lot, but nothing so monstrous as man. For he, unkind to his own kind, inducting them young into dealing and war, dying bequeathing them the developing curse of his enterprise. On the earth, on the seas, and into the air, he visits himself, at best in folly, but often with malice aforethought. Man, the wrong turning, who ordered the fire of the sun into the streets, the parks, and the schools of a town, and there in broad daylight cast people as lasting shadows. For him on whose brow is inscribed, beware, there is nothing I will not do. Why now should the warm-blooded dolphin, the smiling, the playful, the dancer, the maker of music, who ferried the singer Orion to safety, why now should this friend intercede? O oh man, the killer, who multiplies, who schemes in his sleep after ways of living forever, who smothered the law in his heart, in these days of the melting poles, of earthquake and flood, and the cavalry charge of the tides, he knows it now, the law, by virtue of having transgressed, and will stand on the shore as the leaden waves, for his comfort, deliver him carrion, starfish and whales. Oh, swiftly climbing and fouling the lovely curve of the sky, the infinite swarm of death will fall on his fields, and he will have nothing to answer the child who asks, who are they passing on the last of the light? They are Persephone in rags, leading her blinded mother by the hand, seeking an entrance to preferable Hades. Neil mentioned that I have in common with the other two points I'm really glad to be reading with that inevitable um, sense of loss and grief that increases the older you get. I'd like to read now a poem which is a tribute to and an elegy for a very dear friend of ours who died a couple of two or three years ago. Um, she was a Quaker and she used the Quaker phrase when saying goodbye, not as it were goodbye finally, but whenever she left. And the phrase is the title of this poem, I will hold you in the light. Between long absences, having met again, taking her leave, she would say, I will hold you in the light and has gone now where there's none. So for the time allowed, we shall hold her in our light. More of the dark will come in if we let her go. 
and there's already too much of the dark where we are now. Fit to be looked at, that is what one wants to be, fit to be seen in the light of a friend's thinking. And she always did have a look that inquired in a friendly fashion, how are you doing in the things that needed to be done? How have you been getting on with those things since I saw you last? And asked to be looked at herself like that. I remember watching my mother or her mother darn or sew, and that if I stood watching too close, she would say to me, you're in my light, love, I can't see. And remember also that if ever I came with a thing needing seeing to or putting right, either one of the women would say, bring it here, love, into the light. Our dead, though their company grows, are not in our light. We see better for them and holding them in the light, see better what needs to be done or mended and how. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, now we will have Kerry Hardy. Um, Kerry's new poems are the work of time and the cycles of growth. They're songs about saints and scholars, the natural world, exaltation and suffering, and ordinary joy, the quiet accumulation of the slowly learned lessons of a lived life. There are narratives of the wondrous bewilderments of life, as well as homages to the dead and the dying. And her book has just been reviewed by Sean Hewitt in the Irish Times, who said that it's full of a dark, exact lyricism. These certainly are poems which speak skillfully to and from our times. Kerry Hardy grew up in County Down and she now lives in County Kilkenny, which is where she's reading to us tonight from. She published six collections with Gallery Press in Ireland. Her selected poems was published in Ireland by Gallery and in Britain by Blood Axe in 2011. Her later collection, The Zebra Stood in the Night and Where Now Begins, which is her eighth collection, are published by Blood Axe in Britain and Ireland. The Zebra Stood in the Night was shortlisted for the Irish Times Poetry Now Award. Her poems have also featured in no fewer than nine Blood Axe anthologies, reflecting the esteem in which I've always held her work. She's also a fiction writer and has published two novels. So I'd like to work us to welcome Kerry Hardy. Thank you, Neil. Um, I'm afraid I lost that at the end of David's wonderful reading, but um, because of what he was reading, I, I sort of changed my order and I'd like to start with a little poem called Into Light. All prayers are poems incantations arising out of darkness, joy or grief, splinters of feather and bone that flicker and spin and are gone, as brief and intense as a colt its fierce cling to a coconut strung from an ash in the rainy air. Because of the um, of the month that's in it, November. Um, I will go from there to All Saints, which was, is the 1st of November, um, All Hallows after Halloween. And it, it, I, I wrote this to the rhythm of um, the Fiddler of Dooney, who is quite, makes it quite clear that while um, he's not very keen on priests, um, music and joy are very okay. All saints. Bracken like damp fox pelts, a peddler's chilly jest. And the old saints burn for the new young saints flaring red in the west. The old saints roar for the new young saints with the cattle's hunger cry. But the new saints are bright with the last of the light and the moon's on her back in the sky. The old saints and the new young saints have danced on the blade of the knife. The old saints are lepping the sun in fires. The new saints are lepping from life. And I'll go from there to a poem called Fear, 
which is, it, it's about what you do with it, which is, I think, a problem for most of us. Um, you, can, you can look at it or you can sit on it. This one's called How She Disposes of Fear. A yellow house that's patched and stained, a door the colour of old blood, an empty byre, a boarded well. She's lived there all her life. The doors long barred, the years limp past. A shutter hangs, she comes and goes, squats on her hunkers, secretive, digs berry holes and slips it in. She goes about that arid place, kicks at the red hens in the dust, sits for hours where she began, waiting for what comes out. Nothing does while she waits. But afterwards, in the dark of the house, she knows from a crawl in the small of her back that something slid out and is loose. I, I want to read real estate um, for my husband, really. For 30 years, we have walked around inside each other's lives. We pay bills, hang out the wash, comfort children who wake. Sometimes we bury our dead. This is the room we inhabit, fragile as glass, light passing through. And now I'll go to a poem called The Inadequacy of Letters of Condolence, which I wrote for a French friend who lost her, who, whose sister had died. She'd grown up in the, in the war. She'd been a child in the Second World War. Um, I should explain that I live in rural Ireland, so we're sort of surrounded by fields still. The paper white, the ink black, your sister dead in France, this morning dull with January sloth. A blackbird in the ruins of the dead perennials, tossing the sodden leaves, hunting the worm in the ground. The thorn hedge empty and thin, the sheep moving about in the beet field, the undramatic January light. Your wartime childhood, your sister in your wartime childhood, the passionate lost children of our long dead childhoods. The whiteness paper, the blackness of ink, the link in the chain that's wrenched to open, your link falling loose. The blackbird wrote rooting as I write this letter, the sheep in the ravaged beet field that smells now of fish and decay. And I will go now to the opening poem to reflect the concern in this in this reading of, of with with the natural world, it well with our place in the natural world with our we some we're such a sorry my voice is not great it's such a it we're such a dominate we have such a dominating place in our own consciousness it's a small tree but old and its branches unnobbled, ungreened with lichen. This morning the rain falls through the spaces it makes on the print of the world. Its branches are bones holding the air in its place, folding this hillside into the cloth of the sky. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. Um... We're now going to hear from Bill Herbert. Um, Bill is a highly versatile poet who writes in both English and Scots. When he was made Dundee Macca or City Laureate, he intended to write about his hometown in both its native tongues. Then within six months, his much loved father died and that civic idyll was thrown into crisis. His new book, The Wreck of the Fathership is what he calls his Dundonian Book of the Dead in which he explores both his own grief 
and the encroachment of a new intolerance. It's his seventh collection from Blood Axe. Writing in the Morning Star, Andy Croft calls it a series of studies in public disaster and private grief, describing in his review how the book cleverly and movingly folds together several overlapping narratives, the illness and death of the poet's father, the referenda on Scottish independence and the EU, the election of Trump and Johnson, the sinking of the Mona lifeboat in 1959, and the long, slow shipwreck of the post-war consensus. It's a hugely entertaining and inventive collection. Bill Herbert's other books include his practical guide, Writing Poetry, published by Routledge, and he's co-edited two Blood Axe anthologies, Strong Words, Modern Poets on Modern Poetry, with Matthew Hollis, and Jade Ladder, Contemporary Chinese Poetry, with Yang Lian, Brian Holton, and Jin Xiaozhu. He is Professor of Poetry and Creative Writing at Newcastle University, and he lives in a converted lighthouse overlooking the River Tyne at North Shields, which is where he is reading from this evening. And he was Dundee's inaugural Makar from 213 to 218. And would you please welcome Bill Herbert. Good evening. Oh. I'm here. I'm here now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, good evening. And um, I'm very glad to be here, um, especially as here is actually where I live. So um, I'm going to uh, start with a, a few, uh, uh, with, with one poem about Dundee, um, a few poems in Scots dialect, and then I'll move across to English for the, the majority of the reading. I'll read five or six poems, um, three in this first half um, and two or three in the second half. Um, the first poem is called Blackness Cagany, and Blackness was the primary school um, that I went to uh, as, a, as a very small child. And uh, Cagany is that figure that sits at the back of the nativity in Catalan culture. And um, to put it uh, um, as politely as I can, um, squeezes one out. Uh, he's, a, he's a kind of um, a, a, a figure of the earth uh, connecting the, the heavenly um, to, the, to the very, very corporeal. And um, it struck me um, uh, that this, this chimed in with a very strong memory of my childhood, um, uh, which is when the Queen came uh, to Dundee and uh, our school was taken to watch the Queen's uh, uh, car drive by. And uh, the Queen's car took rather a long time to drive by. Uh, so I... Um, uh, I found out that uh, one of my best friends had become so excited by the event uh, that, to, to put it um, uh, uh, bluntly, he'd cacked himself. Um, and uh, we were then taken back to the school after the Queen had gone by, and we were told to write a poem about the experience. It was the first time I'd, I'd ever known um, that, that, that poems were things that you wrote about experiences. And I found that um, uh, one event that slightly um, uh, occluded the other event. So uh, this is Blackness Cagney. Um, the names have been changed to protect the incontinent. Billy Monaghy, a tell nay le, shat his pants as the Queen drove by. Kids are lined the old Perth road, and Billy squatted like a toad. Blackness scales in khaki nave as the black car passed, we a gracious wave. To the bairns were lacht and grat and howled, and the Republican in Billy's bowels. Later, telt he scrive a poem, a thought of the Queen and her wee brun gnome. And ever since sign, a limousine has for me a fecal gleam. Now, as uh, Neil said in his very kind introduction, the, the fathership is uh, kind of caught between two irreconcilables, um, the, the, uh, the, the death of the good father and the kind of um, murderous acts of the, the big bad patriarchy, uh, which um, as we are seeing at this very moment is, 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 uh, is uh, completely unable to relax its, its grip on power and therefore on destruction of the most cataclysmic sort. Uh, so this poem is called uh, The Fathership and is a kind of um, 
a rant or tirade, a flighting as we would call it, um, about this kind of character. And it is uh, dedicated to, 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 the, to the, the, the large orange uh, version. Uh, there's one reference I should say, which is to the uh, the ninth wave. Uh, this is um, uh, kind of a nautical term for the, the the waves that increase gradually in size until the the ninth wave is the one that, that sweeps us um, all away. Um, it's uh, it's a, a painting by uh, the, the Russian artist uh, Ivan Ivazovsky. If if you would like to, to glance at that, but it's really here a, a kind of concept. So at the time of writing the poem, I had no idea that we we might be experiencing a series of, of other types of wave. The feather ship is sinking fast, though inly inty it's in past, while engineers regard loo, its captain cries, abandon crew. You never met a morphosis as rigidly applied as this. Destroyer, whaler, clipper, bark, galleon, galley, argo, arc, the feather ship, the feather ship, Full fathom fifty on it slips. Still at the helm, though it pints rick doon, humming resurgum an ald farrant tune, oor cap kens merchants that nae langer breathe, Atlantean offshore accounts a seethe, to trade in whale sushi, la seepin' zo isle, for merlin zo plastic and nuclear spile. The feather ship, the feather ship, the Mariana trench for your rubbish tip. First fill up the seas, sign tack to the skies, set sail for Mars, on billionaire's prayers. For as it sinks, its rats will raise, swelling on fructage of fascist lies, clinging to spars of colonial cane, and spearing, well, why can't we do it again? Behold their fleet, sons hope or sepite, a flotsam of sin that sop and we spite, Erotic arundel camutha the rami, gorging on guts the unfold the gold lammy. The feather ship, the feather ship, aim at the lifeboats, let grape shot rip. Holes hallowed with grease and hoolin with greed. The seas are a heaven where hell jays feed. Where sharks are a hooli, but why would you save a man's suravulics when here's the ninth wave? Here comes the wan to sweep Athen awa. Mac Jesus and Mary and Jetsam of Ah, the feather ship, the feather ship. He hung up his son, sign Gidam the slip. Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani, kick out the jammy pieces, mammy. The feather ship, you had to query, was I designed as Tapsal Tiri. Its parent company, Poseidon, is a shell for the shells of the upside dune. Our surplus cargo drifts ashore to ensure the poor he scotch galore, while our herniating honk of voices shall droop your nisi foo and noises. The feather ship, the feather ship, who shall we wacken for this bad trip? The feather ship, the feather ship, why shall loosen its old man's grip? To thrapples, lapels, to reins, to guns, he'll never let go till the West is unwon. Saturn merely swallowed his wains, drown daddle grow gills to had on to his gains. The feather ship, the feather ship, wha so loosen its deed man's grip. Old man of the sea, youth scorpion ride, you'll no let go till the youth has died. And I'll conclude this first half with a, a short elegy. Um, the central part of the book is a sequence of, of uh, elegiac poems from my father, which kind of focus in over and over on the, the moment of the death, um, which is a kind of horrible um, gift, a paradoxi paradoxical um, uh, benefit that I was able to be there, which uh, I, of course, now has become something which is, is no longer um, uh, available to us. Um, my father was uh, a merchantman, um, he's, a, he's an engineer. Um, I was also a, a watchmaker in later life, a precision engineer. And that's where part of the, the nautical imagery comes from, uh, including in this poem. My father's hand was larger of palm than mine and shorter fingered, 
and the hairs on its back were blonde amid the grizzling of veins, as though it had previously been the claw of a bear, but instead it had handled the watchmaker's fine devices and worked in the ship's bowels with hot gauges, as though he must recalibrate the earth's turning from its core or adjust it in an orrery till all ran well. So when he was dead, and I'd never hold it again, I wanted to photograph my father's hand, that capable creature, as it lay dead upon the sheet, its heft, its knocks, its tendons, that still held his intelligence, its tenderness and force but it had already taken on the gravity of the depths, as though glimpsed in the wreck of a sunken vessel and would not submit to record, as though to return with this report would set the blood to bubbling in my veins. Thank you, Bill, for that typically contrasting reading of yours. Um, we, we're now going to hear from David Constantine again. Um, David, welcome again. Thank you. I'll read three more poems. The first, uh, the title of it is, is taken from an inscription on the memorial in Manchester to the massacre at Peterloo in August. 1819, the 200th anniversary was commemorated in Manchester by the building, the making of this uh, extraordinarily beautiful monument by an artist called Jeremy Della. It's a series of concentric circles rising up to make a sort of speaker's platform at the, at the top. And on the faces of these circles are the names of the towns and villages in and around Manchester from which the demonstrators came, actually down from the moors, some of them to demonstrate for basic human rights. And also then around the face of these circles, the 18 who were killed that day. And one extra, and this is what uh, shook me the first time I, I saw it. There's a dedication there, the memory of the unborn child of Elizabeth Gaunt. Elizabeth Gaunt herself, survived, but her baby was unborn. Losing her child, they beat it out of her. She lived. Her name is written in the stone among the other named, the dead 18, and her lost child without a name is with her there. The sabred, trampled, bayoneted, shot are dead. Unborn is different. Elizabeth's child evicted by lawful fists and truncheons before her time, having no life, always unborn, given no name, that child, that day of the banners and the bands, the wakes of justice when the generations flowed into the city from the towns and the black uplands, that child carried in secret in a multitude. May she not still be called a faith in hiding, halted for now, leaving the loss, the space, herself a power and a promise, biding for a mother and a local dwelling place. Truly, you have passed on a faith to keep, still wanting the birthright you were dying for, a country fit to live in, to believe somewhere local the lost child bides, whose name is Hope. And a poem called uh, Dancer. Um, I'd already written this poem with a particular child in mind when I remembered a very difficult book that I greatly admire, the French radical philosopher Simon Weil's Gravity and Grace. 
dancer. This five-year-old dancing to the music of a man who died a long, long time ago. When I tell her she is very graceful, she nods as though to say, you don't need to tell me that, and goes on dancing, not knowing, and nor would it interest her to learn what kind of grace I'm telling her she has. For it isn't that of the music, nor a matter of whether she keeps time or not. The man who made the music and died too young was a child to the bitter end. And I think he'd have loved almost as much as I do, the way her right sock will keep coming down and how, pulling it up again, she jigs on her left foot without a smile. Her grace is a serious matter. But as if through the eyes of the old mask, through eons of tears, broke such jolly tunes, the celestial bodies skipped and skated. Her time's not exactly his, but nor does she use his music merely for her back cloth. It's more a place and her way of being in that place, free to keep what time she likes. So I think Lilith, danced in Eden, and the flames and waters of the earth, the trees, the stones, and all kinds of other living things, in a solemn gaiety, danced their own dances with her. And it's true, child, you don't need me telling you you're graceful. The words, 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 you're lighter without them. And lastly, I'll read a poem called uh, Carousel. The, the setting for this is Basel in, in Switzerland. Uh, Helen and I were put up in a very posh hotel. I was on a reading tour. And across the road from there was a vast area of waste ground on which for three days a year in November, a huge fair was allowed to assemble in it. And we spent the evening at that fair among many immigrants, refugees, some of them, who stood there watching their children on particularly this, the carousel, and I watched the children and those watching the children. Carousel. November, early dark, and in the drizzle on wastelands strung with lights, the fair, and at the heart of it, in all the glare and roar, the tuneful, measured, anti-clockwise turning carousel, watchers encircling it. Here is a space to play at letting go, to try, having come thus far, how many seconds separation you can bear after the desert and the sea, after the ice, the hungering, the deaths, and too much entering through the eyes into the kitty of bad dreams. At last, they bid in this arena for another lease of trust and watch their kids go half a revolution out of view, one sailing solo on a swan and then two clutching tight on an elephant arrive and leave and you can see they do not quite believe the looping tune will bring them back again to grown-ups so long at the world's mercy without a tongue to plead who stand now silent in a ring and watch their flesh and blood within it orbiting and wager all on a quaint machinery and entertain the idea that in this pleasure ground, playing at severance is permissible, and that the ancient music is reliable, and keeping time against the clock will bring the children round, take and return the elephant and the swan, strew lost and found on that discouraged audience until they will believe it, if the children will. You let us out of sight, and look, we come again. This travelling Babel, here three nights allowed to set up shop on out-of-town terrain, 
blessed be the flare of it, blessed be the soft rain. So both the circles, those who stand and watch and those who ride, the friendly animals in a fairy tale, at every revolution on the fabulous flat earth, may see through rain and tears, beloved faces lit with mirth, haloed here and now and real. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, we'll now move to Ireland and we'll hear again from Kerry Hardy. Thank you, Neil. Um, Bolt the Shutter. The title comes from a line from Yeats's Murders, the Mist and Snow. Didn't mean to do two Yeats, but up they come. Bolt the Shutter. The face that looks from the mirror has the long bone jaw of my forebears. How age gives them access. They gaze, their eyes black with apprehension. Where shall we go, they are saying, when the hearth of your flesh grows cold? Bare hills look out in answer and the clean, empty skies of the morning. Aging not so easy. Um, I want to read this for Bill because I read his poem about um, his his craving for salt after his father died, and we have a saying which is that the dead leave you a gift. Um, and my my youngest brother developed a craving for awful after my father died. Pishog, he said he developed a craving for the reek of kidneys in the morning kitchen. He said, he said it started in the month his father died. The girlfriend was a veggie, but this one was omnivore going on carnivore. Awful was grist to her mill. I babbled some Pishog I'd heard about unexpected gifts from the dead. He liked that, no end. Saw plates piled with sweetbreads and livers, his chance to abandon the rational, to lap death's gravy, suck its bones, chew gristle from the skeletons of ghosts. I think we are as, um, the Irish are as obsessed with death as the Scots and the Catalans are with what I've, I learned to call jobbies when we lived in Glasgow. Um, this one is for Kieran Carson, who, who was a friend and who died about this time last year. It was written. Um, it was written for a birthday memorial for him, and but no, I I, I I'll just begin it. Um, I live in Kilkenny and we had we have a lot of Polish immigrants who when they first came they were very they were men all by themselves now they brought their families and they're integrating very well but um but we would see them all down the river fishing because they had nothing else to do and they weren't working and um le locally the the expression people complained that the poles have the river fished out so that's the first line it's called Eel Speak for Kieran Carson. The poles have the river fished out. Kilkenny talk. I have my eye on one who's fishing now, a lone pole, tramping steadily downriver, casting in shadow reaches of the old brown barrow. I'm at that game myself, but it's the past I'm working. Alert for memories rise, its circles spreading. A strike, he reels in, lets it run, the water splinters light. It surges, weakens, surges, drops, stunned on the hook's blind bite. He hauls, a rope of muscle bruises the damp grass. He has his meat and I have mine. In the mind's eye, the broken water heaves. My line has flared across the arc of all the years since we were young. I have you hooked, 
hauled in and thrashing on the bank. Not you as you are now, but as you were, all bristled tight and angry like a landed eel and slapping on the hard stones of yourself. Back then it was in music that you moved, you glided on the muscle of its flow. Your words, what words you had, were black with drink. Blind elver tides spawned in deep reaches of your weed-coiled sea. A sea change came. Some impulse of the blood woke in you, forced the catadromus pushed to other shores and music firmed and blunted into words. That pole has bagged his eel and left the bank. I'm off as well to loose mine, live and furious in the barrow, so it can crawl or swim its way to northern climes and home itself once more in lagon waters. Third, um, uh, again, there's a Scots reference in this because the the I I always love ballads and um, the the ballad of the the last line has pays homage to the to our Corbys. Crow light, the end of the day at the end of the year. The sky was old and smoky with dusk, and I stood on the hill and I watched how the crows came flowing and flowing all down the sky. Then the field was spring. It was silvery, shaken, and all the grasses were bowing and dipping. I saw the mowing, saw the new cut hay, the strutting crow working the parchment stubble. And all the while the black host drifting and winter strong and the land not caring and the slouch of fox and the white corpse staring. And I'll finish with bird talk, um, mostly because of the last line, because because it's what, about what David was talking about. Um, bird talk. I am this, said the raven. I banner the shield of the hero. I drift the cloud forms moving at the edges of the mind. I am flight, said the swallow. The equinox swings on its ancient tangent. Be off, it says, you have no business with whores that swell and blood on thinning thorn. I am life, said the wagtail, small, darting and fearful. I skitter and hop, puddle in water, have nothing to promise but mud baths and loss. I am joy, said the lark, a weightless quivering fervor. I rise like the spirit releasing. I crouch in a cat's paw of grass. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. Um, we're going to hear now from Bill Herbert. Uh, before we do, I'd just like to say that um, if you have any questions you'd like to put into the chat line, uh, please do that now. Um, and then at the end of Bill's reading, we'll come together and take up your questions and comments and have a, a collective discussion. So um, Bill Herbert is next. Thank you, Neil. And uh, thank you very much, Kerry, for that, uh, for the, the, the poem about the awful, um, which, uh, which uh, um, uh, touched me uh, deep inside. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to read two poems in this uh, half because uh, I'm aware that I, I blather on in between them. Um, uh, so this one, this first poem is called The Dream of the Airport. And um, it's, uh, there's a lot of voyaging in the book um, uh, and uh, the, there's a lot of attempts to find somewhere that is at home. Um, that, and um, uh, I suppose the thing that, that is most frequently encountered are these, these kind of moments when one steps out of the homely and it finds oneself slightly outside of time. And this is one such incident where we were uh, going to uh, Crete uh, where we've gone many, many years. 
and uh, due to um, a, a very crap car company, um, um, I won't say their name, but it's Gold Star. Don't book with Gold Star. They left us in the airport overnight. Um, there was nothing we could do till the bus came in the morning. And uh, that kind of departure from normal time is something I think that, that people um, uh, who've uh, experienced uh, grief uh, recognize uh, when, it, when it occurs to them, even by accident like this. So the poem is about Crete, um, I suppose, but it's really about that kind of swerving out of what you think is the normal and into another space. Um, the pakama in the poem, sorry, is, is a kind of a, 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 a blanket, um, a, a scar that I, that I carry around with me in my travels. The dream of the airport. The car hire company bestows upon you the great gift of abandoning you to the airport overnight. Returned to the eternal strip lights of your early travels, you wrap your head in the checkered pakama, place the green Ethiopian Airways eye mask on your face and insert the orange earplugs, which can't quite block out the music of the continuity, that shuffling of the less lucky travellers, banging of trays as their diminished possessions are scanned, ping and pronouncement of the missing's names by the same old siren. How many decades have you been passed through here without ever leaving home? Try escaping into your recurrent dream, the one about an airport, then it's four. Abandon sleep to walk directly through the dream of the airport, its labyrinth as one bright, uncomplicating hall. Your minotaur passes, long horns carved with lists, memoranda, minutiae of the dates he fears. His horns score both walls at once. His hooves click and chip this marble. Here's your chance to miss tomorrow in its role as the next episode, to lose the need for such times to pass that dumb urgency. Go out into the night's cool breezes. Be glad the bus which will return you to your place in the action has not yet arrived. Look up. There are still no birds. No stars have been allocated to you. You forget that this is the hour at which your father died. The night is like a charcoal horse pacing in its ash paddock. It chafes itself away as it walks. Walk back into the long departure hall and pass among the pissed off officials, the ecstatic sleepers. We are already within Asclepius's temple. Look at the opposite end. She's still asleep, the woman you must travel with. The furniture of your luggage surrounds her like a room with no walls. She is sleeping in public. We are all sleeping in public together. Sleeping in public together forever. Go to her and rewind yourself in the shawl and pray your head to her head. The lights keep burning. Go to her and dream about the airport in the night. And I'll finish with a poem about 
immigration and arrival. I suppose um, this came about from a very simple political disagreement between the policies and immigration of the Westminster government and the Scottish Parliament about uh, the acceptance of refugees. Um, uh, but the poem um, takes a kind of slightly uh, longer historical slant on this. It's called The Nine Trades Welcome You to the City of Refuge. And the nine trades were the medieval guilds of, uh, of Dundee. Um, and uh, each of them takes a, a verse to, to welcome in increasingly ambiguous terms, ambivalent terms, the, 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 the visitor um, who may or may not survive the welcome. Um, I should mention um, that um, the backs, uh, Mary Shelley, uh, who obviously um, was inspired to write Frankenstein during her stay in Dundee, stayed with the Baxters, uh, a linen merchant, but the Baxters also means a baker. Uh, so that's one of the one of the trades. And um, uh, the only other thing I think I ought to say is that um, the poem hovers around a, a, a few little puns uh, that, that I didn't realize that muslin, the word for muslin comes from Mosul and gauze, the word for gauze, comes from Gaza. These are an epigraph from the locket book of the Dundee weavers. The locket book was the book in which they stored their names and records and it's had a lock on it, hence the locket book. And this is just a little bit of marginalia, which is rather uh, beautiful in the Cherry and Slay stanza. Our stays here and days here are very short and brittle. They short are goes swifter than does a weaver's shuttle. The Nine Trades welcomes you to the city of refuge. The Baxter will bake you a bridey, my bride, my Mary of all the monsters that dream to bind the flesh of the bridegroom fast, all mingled with fragments of shot between. Then the Cordoner will cut out two souls, my son, and so shoes since your pilgrimage is done. Such a shame you should walk to our city unshod, where the tuck was paraded in King Crispin's shade. And the Skinner gi a glove for the hand that you lost, to cutlass or crime or the snow on the hill. So you'll think of its scuttle like a soft-backed crab, a shuttle between all the threads in our mill. The tailor will stitch up the cloth you'll be clad in, since eternity also has sumptuary laws, and his statutes still tell us, nay women shall wear, nay dresses aboon their estate, except whores. Then the bonnet maker caps you wi' a toory, my boy, all black with the Indies' best indigo too, for it's up with the bonnet so bonnie dundee, since all who pay their fees shall be free. And the flesher shall strike you a calf with his axe on Commercial Street, so it falls to his knees, blinded by blood where the shambles once stood, for you're all brawlers, if dusty of feet. Let the hammer men cunningly craft you a gun of the fishtail design or the old lemon butt, and fashion you both the hobart bold and the bullet that shall pierce it. Then the Webster will weave you a shroud safe fine as muslin from Mosul or Gaza's old gauze. The cutty sack shall be your sign that your bairns have been swaddled in some future's cause. And the dyer will print out your ends and your means, inking his press with gall of the oak, listing your numbers, if rarely your names and sealing the news in his locket book. Thank you. And thanks very much for this opportunity to read, Neil. Thank you, Bill. We're now going to move into um, collective mode. Uh, so I'd like to thank David, Kerry and Bill for those excellent readings. Um, we've been getting some comments through from uh, all over. And clearly you've all got um, readers out there who know your work and love your work. 
I'll just pass on a few of those first of all. We've got uh, Geraldine Mitchell uh, saying, beautiful, Carrie, beautiful. Uh, Geraldine Mitchell in County Mayo. And we've got Jane Clark in County Wicklow saying congratulations to all three of you. Um, Jane Thomas, amazing. Thank you, David. I will hold you in the light. Uh, Maureen Alman, thank you, David. That was wonderful and inspiring. Um, what else have we got? We've got greetings again to David from Maggie and Martin Reed, very much who said they were very much forward looking forward to the launch. They're both wearing their Tilly hats. Uh, Suzanne McRae, thank you. Wonderful. Um, Maureen Almond again, loved your dad poem, Bill. Um, now, a couple of questions which we can probably take together um, because they're really both related really to the, the nature of poetry books. So we could start off with that. Um, poet and players have a question for all of you. Uh, what factors do you consider make a book successful? Are they related to the market or, you do, or do you have personal criteria? And then... Maggie Reed, question more about uh, these kinds of events, thanking you for the wonderful readings. Do you have any tips for reading on screen? How does it feel for you to be reading to what must feel like a silent crowd? Would any of you like to chip in on any of those? Um, reading to a silent crowd anyway. the silent crowd one is a, is a is a very good question um i suppose we're all gradually gradually getting used to to, to this kind of uh, this kind of thing i think i think um the crowd is the bit that is hard to imagine because um often um in in a zoom meeting um as i'm doing now i'm, I'm looking at your face neil and and, and it is it is a kind of a a, a, a dialogue or it feels like that, that that there is a kind of proximity and that one could be talking or, or addressing one person directly. I think it's the multiplicity that, that kind of slightly boggles my mind. I, I, don't, I don't have a very strong conception of, of, of the many who are there. But then I don't think that's terribly um, unusual in poetry readings anyway. Um, uh, there often aren't many there to, uh, to imagine. Um, so uh, um, maybe it's not so distinct. We've also got a, a difference in this event to other kinds of online events in that we're not actually doing it straight on Zoom because by doing it on Zoom in a kind of Zoom bubble, um, we can actually make the event go out live on YouTube and then it remains on YouTube afterwards. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the particular benefits of it. Uh, so it's a bit different from a normal Zoom event in that we can't see the audience. And also we have a wonderful tech man, uh, Pete Hebden from NCLA, who's the person who's been uh, doing everything behind the scenes for us. Uh, he's the person who made us go live and he's the person who's been passing on the questions. Um, so we've got one more here from Julia Deacon. Um, have the constraints of 220 made you more or less productive? And if less, what strategies have helped counter this? Anyone want to speak? I can say something. Mm. I, I was supposed to be in, I mean, everybody's had this experience. In, um, in March, when it all began, I was supposed to be going to Berlin for the 250th anniversary of Friedrich Hölderlin. He was born in 1770, the same year as Beethoven and Wordsworth. He's of that great revolutionary generation. And... I and others were supposed to go as representatives of his work translated into a variety of, of languages. Um, and I got, I was getting cold feet even before they called the thing off because I didn't fancy an aeroplane, didn't fancy a hotel and all the rest of it. And then it was called off. Um, and suddenly there was this, this space and also a feeling of having somehow to compensate and make up for what I was not doing in a sort of moral cowardice but in the end it wasn't up to me whether I went or not so we didn't go and I did then sit down and I began a long novella about Hölderlin and his uh, tragic relationship with the wife of a banker and his life being written up by a young man years later who befriended Hölderlin a young man of 15 called Wilhelm Weiblinger and the three of them together haunted me um, day after day after day. 
and I began the thing on the day of the first coronavirus death. And by the time I finished it, um, it was about 30,000 words, the deaths had overtaken my word count. And that will abide with me forever. Um, where we are, we have a nice garden, we have parks. And as everybody said about this particular spring, it was like non, I can remember since childhood, the, the blossom and the bird song and the clarity of the air and the silence. And in that, it was a good place to be writing at the same time in the full knowledge that you were in a, in a place entirely encircled by um, a death ray. You were also writing about someone who was dislocated, weren't you, in a dislocated situation yourself? Yes. Um, he became a celebrity in the latter half of his life when he was put into care, having they have failed totally to treat him in the in fact they treated him very cruelly in the in the what would pass for the hospital, the clinic then, and he went into the care of a of a carpenter's family for the whole of the latter part of his life, where he was very lovingly looked after his own family, having virtually disowned him. And this young man I mentioned was really the beginnings of an effort to to collect his poems properly, to give him his due and, and, and so forth. So it's, and that was a proximity I've been concerned with him since I was 20, I suppose. So it's a lot of years. Um, and this big anniversary um, was to have been a big occasion. And, uh, it, it was, but per, as it were, on the periphery. Sorry, I've been talking a long time about that, but that's my experience of, of what the, the question was about. And I felt kicked into doing it by the space available, by the quiet, and by a terrible urgency within me to, as it were, um, say thanks. Bill or Kerry, would you add anything there from your experience this year? Um. I, I would like to say something. I was, we, we had a national broadcast from the Taoiseach in which he was, appeared white with fear and told us all that we were going to die, etc, etc, etc. And I, I had a very mixed reaction. Part of me was thought, oh great, I can write loads of stuff because I'll have all this time to myself. And the other part was just rage that so many people were so afraid of what in fact has actually affected a small portion and I the road I live on is just down from the road that was the famine route to Callum which was the workhouse and I was out there in as David said this beautiful beautiful spring and um, it was like hearing the voices from the dead and it was like them saying what the hell are you all making such a fuss about I know this is not true for a lot of other people, but for us, it was like that. And then somebody sent me a piece written by a friar in, from Kilkenny in the Black Death. And he was talking about, he said, it's a very moving piece. He said that he was leaving Vellum for anyone who'd continue because he was watching day by day, whole families moving across into death. And, um, so I, I only wrote one poem in, in, during COVID. I wrote this, this poem, which was to say, basically saying, um, do not speak to us of hardship. Lift your spirits to the spring. And I still feel that. Bill, would you like to add anything? I, I think um, for me, uh, it's been a terrible, busy time. I mean, there just hasn't been any let up because of the of the, the, the constant adjustment of work to, to, the, to the, the constantly adjusting conditions. So in fact, um, the imaginative space has been a kind of falling mm. away from that uh, and a, a really um, a, a, a strange um, uh, bliss, you know, kind of a, 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 a kind of at once a, a terrifying thing. I, I'm reminded of, of, of Jung's um, uh, talking about his falling into catabasis, you know, the, the, the kind of uh, the moment when he decided that he would 
he would explore his unconscious and and uh, he talked about it as this dropping into the earth uh, and and, uh, and and a, a lot of very interesting uh, writing came out from that i'm afraid for me almost no interesting writing whatsoever has come out of it at all but but a, a huge amount of interiority and 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 kind of um, a dream and and i i can see that i'm falling towards what was the next book you know i i can see that the thing that i thought was going to be the next book is is somewhere far below me and i'm, I'm kind of a hitting terminal velocity as i as i as i head head towards it because that was a book about um the the, the uh, 16th century dundee um when it was um besieged and and destroyed um uh, in in the, the rough wooing and um, it's a book about um, uh, um, the, a very strange uh, uh, middle Scots document called The Complaint of Scotland, which has got this very strange encyclopedic um, section called the monologue recreative. And um, I've been obsessed with it. Uh, I, I, what uh, David said there echoed very strongly. I've been obsessed with it for 20 years, 30 years and never known what to do about it. And all of a sudden it dawned on me that the man who was writing this was writing it because he literally believed that his culture was about to be swept away. And that was why it was an encyclopedic book. That was why everything had to go into it because he just didn't believe that, that they were going to survive this. And, and that kind of, that delirious vertigo, I have to say, is, has been my main, my main experience um, high in the tower here. Got to stay away from those. I was, I was very struck in your readings tonight that you all, they all featured refugees in one or other settings. Um, David with the refugees in the carousel, Bill with the welcome to the refugees, uh, Kerry with the Polish refugees in fishing. And this is also a year in which we've had the spectacle of refugees uh, drowning, not in the Mediterranean, where they're still drowning in the Mediterranean, but in the English Channel trying to get from France to England and that's been one of the events of the year but I spoke at the beginning of the reading about the, the private and the public which is goes through all your work and it struck me that you have been responding uh, very much to the plight of refugees in your work. Um, anyone want to expand upon that at all? Um, can I start again? Uh, in my case for the last Seven years. I've um, I was the mentor of a refugee from Syria who got out with his wife and three children, an absolutely perilous exit from it, from the place, and um, since then been living in in Oxford and being looked after by he and his wife and the kids by a charity called Refugee Resource and. Um, He's become my friend. I've ceased to be his mentor. He's become my, my friend. And I've um, I felt through him that the damage done to him and his wife is colossal and probably irreversible and that the children are doing well. And that's a fairly well-known syndrome, I think. Um, Trauma, which I began to understand through him, is not something that you easily, if ever, actually get over because it's not like memories, which if you remember a thing, it gets sort of uh, pigeonholed away in a part of the brain and you can retrieve it. If it's an unpleasant memory, it may make you sad, but, but trauma is a, a thing that um, is just there all the time. And through the refugees, I, I, I learned of one chap in that um, condition who phoning his counsellor, that is a man who was looking after him and had nothing but kindness for him, suddenly that counsellor's voice reminded him, and not just reminded, but replaced itself into the voice of his torturer. At that point, he's back in it, he's not remembering it. And it's things like that that were way beyond my experience that I've got more knowledge of and it sensitizes you towards and I think once having even that little the the vile spectacle of of a lot of 
political life towards these deeply, deeply unfortunate people. I've not met one yet, and I've met many who could be classed as somebody who was just bunking off out of one place to ease a, earn a cushy living in, in, in another. There is a, a vast shortage of proper, effective sympathy from the top, not locally. I mean, I'm sure everybody's had this experience of the vast amount of local help, local authority help, um, and help from groups. But we, we, this is too obvious to say, really. We, from the top down, we've had mostly uh, a parochial, embittered, and frankly nasty sense of what so much of the human race, through no fault of its own, is actually suffering. The idea that they're trying to get across the, you know, the channel to, to sort of doss around in Brighton, amusing themselves, is is, is, is so stupid. Mm. Thank you, David. Um, we don't have any more questions, but it just struck me before we finish, um, that you have been responding to each other's work in the course of the reading, uh, Kerry's case even changing the poems that she was reading because of what she's just heard. Um, is there anything any of you would like to say about um, the, the other poems you've heard tonight or um, and um, anything else you'd like to add? I was so taken by Kerry's. I could have changed every poem I was going to read um, because uh, every every poem set off another resonance, and and it was it was nice that the, the, that we were off camera when it happened uh, when you were reading because I was running around my room looking for books, but the whole time you were reading, I was I was I was listening, I was listening and trying to find a book at the same time. Um, uh, so it was um, it was a great delight to, uh, to hear you um, and and that that's like that ballad. That ballad resonance coming through all the time. I, I found that very moving. Um, I can say the same. I'd read I'd read a good deal of both of you before before this evening, and the poems came up that I recognised from that reading. I was going to say earlier about what what you win and what you lose in this. What I what what I lack, what I feel the lack of in a Zoom thing is I can't see faces. Therefore, I can't adjust as I'm going along. I've got no real idea how well or badly I'm doing. But the listening to other people's poems in it is is a it's better. Um, is is better. It's it's a it's an intimate kind of listening, and uh, yeah. that I hadn't I hadn't realised how good that that could be and would be. Yes, I, I, I'm the same because. I, I mean, I hate all this stuff. I hate technology and I hate not being able to touch somebody and not being able to be in their presence. And But but the listening was almost as good for me a poem as is the page, but it was all, it was, it was different. And um, it was lovely. I, I, I experienced your poems in a different way than I had when I, I read them before. And, um, and I just want to say one thing about refugees. I think you shouldn't be too hard on yourselves because we had, have had a very ambivalent re um, response to refugees, despite the fact that for hundreds of years, you have very little history of emigration. For hundreds of years, we've been immigrants. It's, the Celtic Tiger was the first time that the Irish returned home. And so in one sense, there was... A, among the, the, the population, there was a huge, yes, this has happened to us. We must let them in. We must bring them in. We must welcome them. But at the same time, there was also an anger. And the way we just, we treat um, people coming into direct provision is disgraceful. Thank you, Kerry. Well, I think we can uh, wind up here. It's been lovely to hear you all reading from your own homes and that's one of the other things that comes over well in the Zoom. Uh, Carrie actually, one of her poems was about the room, the space she inhabits, uh, which she's actually reading from. Um, so I'd like to thank um, David, Bill and Carrie, um, and I'd like to thank the audience very much for coming to tonight's event online. Um, there are links on the U YouTube page for the books. I hope you'll want to order some of them. Um, and I'd like to thank Pete Hebden for very ably helping us in the background all the time. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for coming. And thank you, um, David Kerry and Bill for reading to us tonight. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you. Thanks from me.